It was a Wednesday night in November of 1977. And my parents had gone to church. My mom always played the piano, and so she never missed a Wednesday night. So they went to church, and after church, for whatever reason, they decided to go play cards at a friend's house in Maysville, Missouri. So they drove over, and they played cards. They stayed later than they normally would for whatever reason. And, and on the way home, my mom started to have contractions. And so she dropped my brother off at my grandparents' house, and then they rushed to St. Joseph, Missouri, to the hospital there, got there about one in the morning. And somewhere around two in the morning, one or two in the morning on that Thursday morning, I was born. I came into the world. And they, I was delivered by Dr. Dumar, and Dr. Dumar was an older gentleman, and the reason they picked him is because he was the cheapest. And I don't think that affected me too much, but I'm here. And uh, so about six weeks later, my mom goes in for a, for a checkup for six weeks and find out, found out that she was pregnant with my brother, Ben. I don't even think that's legal, but I don't even, I don't know. Somehow we share a birthday like for part of the year. It's really weird. And, um, but where I was born had an effect on my life. We grew up in a small town and throughout my kid years and some of my teenage years, we grew up in a small town and and that shaped my upbringing, my thoughts, and my friendships, and opportunities, or sometimes lack thereof. There really wasn't a church uh, around that, that we were wanting to go to, so we drove to St. Joe to go to a larger church there. And while we were there, as I was a teenager in the youth group, I met my wife as a teenager in the youth group. Eventually, we get married. Eventually, I become the youth pastor of that uh, church that we went to, and God was, you know, putting calling on the inside of me and all this type of stuff. But where I was born, it really had an effect on my life. And I want you to think about this, where you were born, think about wherever that is, think about the impact it's had on your options, your choices, your relationships, your, your um, possibilities. Think about the trajectory of your life because you could have been born at any time in history. I want you to think about this. Any time in history, God could have chosen for you to be born. It could have been hundreds of years ago, a couple thousand years ago, could be sometime in the future that we've not even seen yet. But God knew that you were going to be born when you were born, where you were born, and it does have implications. You could have been born any place on the planet. I mean, many of us, we've, we've been born into a, a lot of a land of opportunity, as we call that. But you could have been born in another location where this morning you might have had to carry water for a couple of miles just to get clean water. I mean, you know, that's the reality for people. And it, it really affects things in your life because where you're born, it has intrinsic, um, it has an intrinsic advantages, but also intrinsic disadvantages. And I want you to think about that for just a second. Think about the advantages of where you were born, or maybe the disadvantages of things you might have missed out on. And there's a lot of talk about this. I mean, people even talk about how the season you were born in has different effects. How many of you guys, some of you guys understand this because maybe you were born just a little bit early or a little bit late in the school year, and so maybe you were the oldest person in your class because of how you went into, or maybe the youngest person. I was actually the youngest person in my class. And so that has an effect, right? I mean, you're smaller than everybody else all the time. I was smarter than they were, but I was smaller, and I got better grades than they did, but... We're not here to talk about that today. Um, but it does have different advantages, different disadvantages. There's whole books that are written about the birth order. How many of you guys have heard that before? Like if you're the firstborn, it kind of affects your personality, or the secondborn, or middle child, and all this research that goes into that. Certainly your geography affects you. It affects your ec economic opportunities and the family that you were born into. You could have been born into a palace. You could have been born into a very rich family or very born into poverty. All these things affect your life. Now you might be thinking, what does that have to do with following Jesus? <laughs> Well, the answer is a lot. It actually has a lot to do with following Jesus. And here's why. Because as a follower of Jesus, this not only has practical realities that we have to work out in our life. Like these are practical things of where you live, how, many, how much access to resource do you have, what kind of family you grew up in, what kind of hurts you grew up in and from that you have to deal with. So it has these practical realities 
But there are also spiritual realities that we need to learn to live into. That there's a spiritual world that we've actually been born into. And just like the natural world, it has just as many implications for our life. I'd say many more implications for our life. And there's a very famous passage of scripture that we're going to look at today in John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. He, he did this most likely because he didn't want to see, be seen by his buddies coming to Jesus. Because there was a little bit of controversy, right? And so he goes by night and he said to them, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one else can do these signs unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again. How many of you guys have heard that phrase before? Born again. It's where we talk about being a born again Christian. You might have heard that before. Uh, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so then Nicodemus asks the obvious question because he's never heard this concept before. And he says, he, he says, uh, how can a man be born when he's old? He's like, I'm old. How can I be born again? That doesn't even make sense. I thought you were a good teacher. Can he enter into a second time, like a second time? Does he like go back into his mom's womb? Like, how does this all work, Jesus, and be born? And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That word enter is so important because when you are born again, you don't have control over what you were born into. How many of you guys know you didn't get to choose your parents, right? Like in your net, you didn't get to choose your parents. That's something you could not control. You didn't get to choose where you were born, when you were born. It's something you could not control. The world you were born into in the natural already existed. You had nothing to do with it. You went in, you had to play by those rules all of a sudden because you were born into a world that previously existed. Now, when you are born spiritually, what I want you to understand is in like manner, you are born into a world that existed before you showed up. You were born into a kingdom that already existed, into a culture of the kingdom of God that existed long before you showed up. And it was already there. And so my, my son, Sean, preached last week. How many of you guys know he did a great job last week? It was awesome. And he talked about... He talked about not just, like, you haven't just been saved from things, but you've also been saved to things. And so what I want to do is build on that just a little bit and talk about what have you been born into? Because this has great implications for our life. And another way to put this is what would I tell somebody who just got born again or who just got baptized? We got to baptize, I think it was like 13 people out in the park last week. That was amazing. A few weeks before that, yeah, that was awesome. A few weeks before that, we baptized 17 people right down here in the three services on that weekend. Earlier in the year before that, I think we baptized a bunch too. And so I'm losing count of how many people were baptized, right? But what, what were some things that maybe I'd tell somebody? Of course, several things. But I think if I could get these concepts in their core, it might lead them to other things that might be very helpful. And I believe it's something that will help all of us to be reminded of these things because they're so, so important. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. says, let us therefore receiving a kingdom and then begins to describe the kingdom. It is firm, it is stable and cannot be shaken. Since we've received a kingdom that is firm and stable, cannot be shaken, then let's offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with modesty and, and pious care and godly fear and awe. You've been born into the kingdom of God. So what are the implications of being born into the kingdom of God? First thought is this, you were born into a firm faith, not a subjective truth. The world already existed that you were born into. The kingdom already existed that you were born into. And it is a firm faith. It's not a subjective truth. Barna is a research uh, company, that, uh, uh, an organization that does a lot of research. And they have a new book out, fairly new, on American worldviews. And by the way, a worldview, if you didn't know, is just simply a filter by which you experience, interpret, um, and respond to the world. It's like a decision-making filter. It's the way you see the world. It's like the lens you see the world through. Listen to this. 
Only 6% of American adults possess a biblical worldview. 6%. Now, there are other worldviews that hold less percentage than the biblical worldview. They would be things like secular humanism, moralistic the- the therapeutic deism, postmodernism, Eastern mysticism, Marxism. All of those have less percentage than biblical worldview, but still, 6%? That's, that's a staggeringly small number. And so what happens is most people, almost nine out of 10 people, according to their research, research almost nine out of pe- 10 people, their worldview is nothing more than a customized personal blend of ideas adopted from multiple philosophies of life. This is called syncretism, where you're just taking all of these different ideas. You might take a little bit. You might take some from the Bible. You might take some from, uh, you know, a different philosophy or or a book that you've read. You might take some from your childhood or your upbringing. You might take some from hopefully not the internet, and and you just blend it all together. Nine out of ten, basically, that's that's the worldview. It, it doesn't get better. Only 9% of U.S. adults, listen to this, who describe themselves as Christian possess a biblical worldview. 9% of people who say, I'm a Christian. How many of you guys know though? A lot of people say they're Christian, right? So just because you say you're a Christian does not mean your decision-making filter is being filtered through a biblical worldview. It may just be a a big mixture of all these things coming together and creating your own worldview. Of self-identified Christians, these statistics are horrifying to me. Self-identified Christians, people who say, I'm a Christian, 64% of those say that all religions and faith are of equal value. So of all the people that you meet that call themselves Christians, 64% of them will say, yeah, all faiths are are basically the same. 58% of self-identified Christians believe that, self-identified Christians believe that if a person is good enough or does good enough things or does enough good things that they can earn their way to heaven. This is not what the Bible teaches if you didn't know that. 58% contend that the Holy Spirit is not a real living being, but merely a symbol of God's power, presence, or purity. It's not what the Bible teaches. 57% of self-identified Christians believe in karma. This, I think, is a product of the internet. <laughs> where we just start to adopt. We see a meme, we see a post, we see a reel, we see something that looks good, sounds good, makes us feel good. And so we just, ad- we just adopt it and we just add it to the way we think about things. This is a problem, right? Because w- many of us, we, we claim to be born again. We've been born into this kingdom But the problem is we end up treating it like a subjective truth, just something that can just go with whatever we feel, whatever we see, whatever makes sense to us, instead of whatever the word of God says, right? So uh, last week, uh, last weekend, we did a garage sale. How many of you guys are like garage sale people? Like you like going to garage sales? Nobody, okay, okay, a few people. There we go, come on, it's okay. So there's not a stigma behind it. Like I'm a garage sale person, right? My grandma took us, we grew up on garage sales, man. We would get up early and we'd go drive to garage sales. And man, it was just like training. Now I think I can drive by a garage sale and I can tell you if it's a good garage sale just by a drive by. <laughs> it's like a 10 spiritual gift for me. I'm just like, nope, Becca, it's not a good one. Just keep going, right? And so we, we were doing a garage sale and like, I don't know, very few people showed up. So we're bored on the second day and my daughter Lindsay's there and Pastor Aaron's daughter Kylie's there. And so there's no one showing up. And so we're just like trying to keep, you know, keep busy. And so somebody invented this game and they were like, okay, out of all the stuff we have laid out here, all the random stuff, we're going to give you some prompts and you got to go find it. And we'll have a contest to see you can come back with the best, best item that matches the prompt. And one of the questions was like, find something that someone would take on vacation, but you never would take with you on vacation but you kind of understand why they did it. And uh, so find something that, 
that someone would take on vacation. You never would, but you kind of understand why somebody would do that. I knew somebody uh, once who took an espresso machine on a vacation, Pastor Aaron. I don't... <laughs> but I kind of understand why, you know? Like, I kind of... I would never do it, but I kind of understand why. And so they went out, and they tried to find it, and they had a little contest. Well, one of the questions was, find something that somebody, would, that somebody from the 1800s would not know what it was. And so they're out trying to find a piece of technology that if they traveled back in time. And then a follow-up uh, prompt was, find something that someone from 1,000 years from now that they would have no clue what to do with this. That they'd have to figure out what it is, just to make up what it is, because they would have no context for it. And so they're out trying to find this thing. I was thinking about that this week, and I thought, that's kind of the position we find ourselves in here. 2,000 years later, thousands of years after the Bible's written, and sometimes like multiple thousands, if you go back to the Torah, you go back to all the early writings, and I think there's a temptation for us, now thousands of years later, to kind of make up what we think it was. Because we don't know what to do with it in our current culture and context. And so what we have is a bunch of people reading the scriptures and just kind of making up what they think it says. Instead of going back to the firm foundation, what is this? What does it mean? What does it say? Why did they write this? Here's a news flash for everyone we don't get to make it up. We have been born into it. It's a received faith, not a made up faith. That's why we're faithful to unchanging scripture rather than shifting culture. Because we were born into it. I just say, if you are a follower of Jesus, you don't even get an option. Like you don't get to make it up. This is why, as followers of Jesus, we talk about being for life in the womb, right? Because I read the scriptures, and the Bible talks about how we were knitted in the womb, how God even knows us in the womb. We do that not because it's a political statement. We do that because the Bible says that, right? But we're also, because of what the Bible, and this is where we got to take it out of the political re arena, we're also not just in life in the womb, but we're womb to tomb. Because if you read the Bible, there's all kinds of stuff in there that talks about taking care of people after they're outside the womb even. That's why we're interested in foster care, orphan care, elderly care. That's why we're, uh, you know, uh, we try to serve people in under-resourced areas, uh, maybe even in the inner city or maybe across the world. Why? Because the Bible talks about being for all life, right? So that challenges our, because, because here's what happens, this, this world system tries to co-opt us into political talking points into bibli rather than biblical talking points. And we have to be careful that we're not co-opted by the, by the world around us, but we go back to Scripture and we say, what does the Bible say? And whatever it says, I'm firm on. And if it says I'm for life, then I'm for life. Uh, then I'm for all life. And that means, and here we go, that means it's not America first. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. And so as believers who've been put on this geography, just because we've been put in this geography, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we don't have a heart, the same heart that God has in Scripture for the whole world. By, by the way, the Bible wasn't written to America. Boy, man, it's awful quiet, man. Saturday night was so much more fun than you guys right now. I love it when people, I had people even this morning, it's like, man, I, I love it when you preach because you preach it strong. And then I just like, I wonder if you second guess sometimes if you like that. The Bible tells us to lo love our neighbor. But you know what the Bible also says? To love the stranger who's in your midst. That if a stranger comes knocking on your door, you give him a cold drink of water. The Bible even goes so far to say, love your enemy. So whoever our enemy is. So that God so loved the world. And so you know what our heart has to be? To love the world. It means that, well, let me just go even further. I mean, we're already here. Let's just keep going. It means that you're not old-fashioned. 
when you stand for biblical marriage. You're not on the wrong side of history. What you are is you are, you're finding yourself as a person of conviction that holds fast to what Scripture teaches, to the time-tested truths of the Bible that were here when you got here and will be here when you're gone. That means, that doesn't mean we have to be culture warriors. Like, that's very popular today, is just to be a culture warrior. And let's say, no, I don't, I don't see Jesus doing a lot of that stuff. But it also means we're not culture cavers where we cave into everything and we have to all of a sudden reframe everything just because it's not popular in our current culture of the day. It means that you are a believer in something that stood the test of time. It's here now. It will be beyond your life and into eternity. It means that when we are born into a firm faith that we are now a, a trust, we've been entrusted as a caretaker of divine truth that we have received, by the way. We don't get to make it up. We've received it. We're caretakers of it. And it means that we have a tiny part of helping to preserve that, to be faithful to it, and to pass it on to the next generation. You know, there have been people throughout all of time and history, since the scriptures have been written, since God created the world, who have been caretakers of that, scribes that wrote, that faithfully wrote the scriptures and transcribed them and, and passed them on down. Spiritual mothers and fathers throughout the first few centuries after Jesus rose from the dead who were faithful to give their life to protect the truth so that the next generation would have a pure and undefiled expression and remembrance of who God is and what God has said. There have been spiritual mothers and fathers who have, throughout the centuries have, have given their life to protect against heresy, against people who've tried to co-opt the scriptures, who've tried to conform the scriptures, who've tried to make it up into something they wanted it to say and it made them feel better rather than what the truth actually is. And here it is, it's our turn. What are we going to do now that it's our turn? Are we gonna be faithful or in a time where it, all around us is shifting sand, will we be the type of people that with love in our heart and the scripture as our foundation, with arms open wide to the world, standing firm on the truth of what God has said? Are we going to be those type of people? We have to be faithful to the faith we've received and not give in and make something up. Why? Because we have been born into a firm faith and where you have been born has implications. So you were born into the kingdom of God and that world already existed and we've been born into it and we have to be a caretaker of it and not change it to a subjective truth. All right, the next, the next thought, I'm gonna show you a video recap of our picnic. How many of you guys were at the picnic last week? Anybody at the picnic? It was an awesome time. And I'll let you, as you watch this, that you can try to guess where I'm going next. And even if you don't, it's still a great video. So here's a recap of last week. It feels like coming home Every time I come to you Cause my home is where your heart is So I'm running into you time. Here's a second thought about where you've been born. You have been born into a spiritual family, not a business partnership. 
You know, it's popular to go from church to church looking for the best they have to offer over another church or the perks or what, you know, how good this is or that is. And I've met with many people over the years who are doing just that. They ask me those direct questions like, what does your church offer? And like, I'm supposed to be doing a sales pitch or something like, like selling them a condo or something, you know? And, uh, and listen, I, I understand every church, every local expression, every family of believers is not a fit for every person. It's just not. Like we have to kind of realize that, that there are certain environments that certain people thrive in and other people not as much. And I understand that there are real reasons why not to be in certain churches for sure. And I understand that there are seasons of your life where God may call you in a season to a a particular location or a particular group of people. And other times when he may call you away from that. And I understand that all Jesus-loving, Bible-believing churches are a part of the big family of God. I understand all of that. But here's what I also understand. Local churches, like one you're a part of this morning, they are practice for being in the family of God. There's a scriptural mandate, I believe, to plant in a local church, to give in a local church, to serve in a local church, to be in relationships with other people in a local church. I believe it is a non-negotiable. When you are born into the family of God, you are born into it and you are you are called to now participate in the life of a local expression of of a church. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a journey church. There are many wonderful churches, amazing churches in our area that God may call you to. But what I'm saying is, if you are called to this local expression, you have been born into a family and there are certain obligations you have that you've been, now that you've been born into the family of God, because it's not all pretty. Sometimes there's chores to do. How many of you guys in the family, there's chores to do, right? There's chores. Sometimes there's chores to do. Sometimes there's things that it'd be like, like, can you just imagine like if one of my kids came to me and I asked them to do something to clean their room or something like that, and they were like, dad, that's not my calling. <laughs> I understand that, but there are ants in there now from that cup you left in there, my friend. Sometimes there's arguments. We call them disagreements. Sometimes it's wonderful. And I hear story, like I was at the picnic, man, and I heard story after story of people as I went around and I talked to people of amazing things that God did, how people got connected. Chris and I, we were, we were talking about several stories as well, just, just how God ordained different connections with people in this church and the miracles that have happened. And I talked to person after person after all these things that God was doing in their life. It's wonderful. There's amazing, wonderful things that happen. Sometimes it's tragic and we show up for one another in our darkest hour. We serve one another. I can look around right now and I know several stories from people who've gone through many tragic things, losses, hard times. And we've walked together with those with you in those times. What I'm trying to communicate is you don't do that in a business arrangement. You do that in a family. And if you forget that you have been born into a family, then you will treat it like a business arrangement and you will miss out on the beauty and the hardship (laughs) that comes with being a family. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 says, So then you are no longer, you've been born again, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members, listen to this, of the household of God. That word household, it literally means a close relative. It's saying that when you've been born into the family of God, these are now your family. These are now your family. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Listen to this language as it keeps going. In whom the whole structure being joined, what? Together. Grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built 
on your own so that you can be an individual Lone Ranger Christian, so that you can watch from home on the internet and not have to be around people and never have to be hurt again. Is that what the scripture says? No. It says you are being built together. That wasn't in the scripture or my notes, but I still think it's good theology. You are being built together to be what? It's, it's in the togetherness that we are actually a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. There is something that happens. Yes, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but no, you were not designed to live this Christian life as an island to yourself, just in your family bubble, coming to church, finding your spot, leaving, protecting yourself. That is not what the Scripture says. It's just not. It's a household. It's a close family together. And can I just tell you, that means pain. That means work. That means it's hard. It doesn't mean it's easy. But again, if we want to be faithful to Scripture, to the first point, to realize I've been born into a firm foundation that came here before I was here, and I need to be faithful to Scripture, and we get all excited about the things in Scripture that we want to be faithful to, but then when it comes to something that's a little bit closer to home, all of a sudden we start to turn it into subjective truth, don't we? I was listening to a teaching years ago, and it was, I think it was to leaders and to pastors. And he was talking about in, in this, uh, this idea, like in a family or maybe in an organization, especially in a church. So let's just use a church context, or you can use your business or whatever it is. But he says, you've got to understand, whatever you're doing, if you're serving in a parachurch organization or whatever it is, you'll discover that there are some people that as you work together for whatever God's called you to do or whatever you're doing, there are some people who are for you. Like they got your back. Like they are for you. But you will also discover along the way that there are some people who are just for what you're for. And so there are people who you might find beside you that are like, man, yeah, let's get, and then as soon as you change, let me just use myself as a pastor. As soon as, let's say, I, I change just a little bit of direction of our focus for a season, I can discover really quick who the people were who were for us or who were simply just for what we were for. And as soon as we don't do exactly what they were for, I discover very quickly, oh, they weren't for us, they were for what we were for. And then he goes on to say that there are some people who are against what you're against. And that, believe me, that's really popular today. All you have to do is look at the news and there are a lot of people who gather together because, man, we hate this, we don't like this, and it gra gathers a crowd, right? And that's the biggest, that's the most popular way to join forces today is find people who are against what you're against. But then there are just people who are against you. And how many of you guys, you don't even have to think too hard about who those people are in your life, right? It's like, I already know, a lot of these people are against me, right? What, what I want us to see in this scripture as hard as it is, as messy as it is, as imperfect as it is, as, as many times, listen, as a pastor, I've been hurt a thousand times. I should be, I, I should have a lot of reasons why not to love people and to guard myself. But I can honestly tell you, I mean, the people closest to me, I believe they would tell you this, that I love people more than I ever have in all of my life. And it's not a naive love. Like, I understand how to be hurt. I understand. I understand. I've been there. But I believe that it is because I've weathered that and chose to love beyond the hurt that is actually a deeper kind of love that I actually have for people. I've learned to love beyond the disagreement, beyond the hard, beyond the hurt. That now when I say I love you, Boy, it costs me something to do that, but it's also way deeper. And so when we're in a church like this, here's our goal. I want, to, I want to give us the target, the target in our church. And I know we're not there, but I'm telling you the target. The target is that whenever you are a part of this family, that you are for one another. That we're not just here because we're for what we're for. And we're not just here because we're against what we're against. But even in the disagreements that we're still for each other. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about family. All right, last, last thought is this. You were born into a future kingdom, not just the present reality. The reason we have to get that is because it's so popular to just 
bounce around from church to church trying to find what we're looking for. And I, I just want to go back and hit that. And by the way, I know of no one currently, I know of no one who's thinking about moving out of this family. <laughs> I, I literally, which is kind of a rare thing because I always know of somebody. Um, but I know of nobody. So I'm not preaching that as a result of something. I'm, I'm telling you wherever God has called you, plant and it's going to be hard, but it's going to be good. But the way you do that is this last thing. You realize I've been born into a future coming kingdom. So here's what it means. And this is the most fun part of the whole message. That when you understand, one of the things that Jesus gave us a clue about in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells us how to pray, and he shares this in Matthew 6.10. He says, and this is what we have hanging up out on our, our lobby wall out there, a version of it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, we as believers, we realize that we have received a kingdom that is already in place, but we are also receiving a kingdom that is coming. And so when Jesus tells us to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, how I many you guys know one day in the kingdom of God, in eternity, there are no more tears, right? There are no more pain. There's no more sickness. There's no more whatever, right? What he's telling us is to look at what that will be and believe for it to pull some of that into right now in the here and now. See, faith pulls the future kingdom into the now. That's what faith does. You, anybody ever have jet lag before? Anybody ever traveled on a long trip? You got jet lag? There's all these studies for how you can avoid that. You know, you like to stay hydrated, don't drink coffee, you know, all this stuff to try to, you know, trick your body and stuff. Harvard did some research on this. And one of the things they said to do, so if you're getting ready to go on a long trip, you might try this and, and tell me if it works or not. But they say that before you go on a trip, start to eat in the time zone that you're going. So if you find out whatever time it's going to be, you know, tw you know, seven hours ahead or whatever, you figure out when breakfast is going to be, and you, you eat breakfast then. So you might be at 2 a.m. in the morning, just like eating breakfast, eating a bowl of cereal, Lucky Charms, or something like that. And then you find out when lunch is, and you eat lunch at that time. And what you're doing is you're conditioning your body to be prepared for the time zone you're going. Does anybody see where we're going with this? You see, faith begins to condition our body our lifestyle for the time zone we're going into, except for we're doing it here and now. So we, we find out when breakfast is in heaven and we start eating breakfast then. We find out what it looks like in heaven and we start living that now. Faith lives in the time zone that we are going into, not in the one that we are in. So that when people start to look at us it looks a little different because we look like we're living in a time that has not happened yet. But we become a reflection of the soon coming kingdom in the here and now. That's faith. That's what we're called to do. You have been born into that kingdom where you can have access to live at that kind of level. You have been born into a future kingdom to be lived out in the here and now. How do you do that? Well, one of the scriptures is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is in the Amplified Version. It's supposed to be louder. That was a joke. Saturday night laughed way better than you guys did. Um, it's also in the Amplified Version because this week I left my other Bible at home and all I had was an Amplified translation, so there's a lot of scriptures in the Amplified. I just thought, it sounds good. All right, now faith is the assurance. It's the title deed, the confirmation. What does this mean? That means Faith, if I can have faith in the future coming kingdom, what it means is I believe that the future coming kingdom is legit. I have like a title confirmation that it is going to happen. And I also have an invitation by Jesus himself to start pulling that into the here and now. And I do that by faith. It's the assurance of those things that are hoped for, divinely guaranteed. And it's the evidence. So my faith, living by faith in the here and now, the kingdom that will come, is evidence of things that aren't being seen in the visible. It's the conviction of the reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot currently, I add currently in there to help us understand, cannot currently be experienced by physical senses. And so what is the invitation? You have been born into the kingdom of God. It's a firm faith, not a subject, subjective truth. You've been born into the kingdom of God. It is a spiritual family. It's not a business partnership where you try to find the best deal. 
You've been born into the kingdom of God, which is also a future coming kingdom that we live by faith in the here and now. We don't just experience our present reality. You don't get to choose where you're born, but you can decide if you will fully live. So many of us, unfortunately, are like those statistics that I read earlier, where we say we're a Christian, but we're not really believing the Christian, the biblical worldview when it comes to certain areas of our life. We've got syncretism. We just pull a little bit here, pull a little bit there, pull a little bit from our feelings, pull a little bit from our past, pull a little bit from the internet, pull a little bit from our past experience, pull a little bit from the scripture, pull a little bit from a book we read, and we make up how we feel. And so I believe there's an invitation for us that you don't get to choose where you're born, but you can decide if you're gonna fully live in the kingdom of God. And so when I fully decide, when I decide to fully live in the kingdom of God, I have to put on the future coming kingdom of God glasses, if those are a thing, right? So if I had future coming kingdom of God glasses and I could put them on, what does that mean? That means I would be able to see life through the eyes of the future com- coming kingdom and live that way. And so I'm asking the question, how will I live in the new creation, not in this world system? As a person of faith, that's the question you're asking. How do I live now in the creation that is to come by faith? How do I live now in the kingdom I've, been received, I've received, but also in the kingdom that is coming by faith? Another way to ask this is if Jesus were me, what would he do? If Jesus were me, how would he live? Now, if I haven't preached strong enough yet, let's just come in for a landing really nicely. I can tell you this, if you really want to put on kingdom, future kingdom coming glasses, if you really want to say, what would Jesus do if he were me? And you put those on, let me just tell you, Jesus isn't offended. You can't wear future coming kingdom glasses and be offended. Jesus also doesn't have misplaced priorities masquerading as urgent things. When you look at Jesus' life, if Jesus were you, he wouldn't do that. Jesus doesn't have excuses that are bathed in spiritual language to make it sound right. Jesus, this is the hard thing. I mean, I'm not pretending this is easy because I struggle with this, I'm talking about daily, like daily, I'm struggling with this and realizing that, man, how many of you guys know sanctification, man, it is hard. Thank goodness we have the help of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Speaking of help of the Holy Spirit, Galatians chapter five, verse 22, in the Amplified, says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the result of his presence within us, thank goodness we have the Holy Spirit, the result of his presence within us, it produces future coming kingdom type things. Because how many of you guys know in the kingdom of God, what is there? The future coming kingdom, it's love. It's also, that means unselfish concern for others. Future coming kingdom, what are you gonna experience? Joy, unspeakable, full of glory, that inner peace that God puts in your life, that peace of God that passes all understanding. Patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. There's a sermon in there. (laughs) Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, here's what it's saying. Those who have been born again into this kingdom, if you have been born again, you you belong to Christ Jesus, you have crucified the sinful nature, together with his passions and appetites. So here it comes. If we claim to, if we claim that I'm a follower of Jesus, if we claim that I've got the Spirit of God on the inside of me, if we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also then walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, moral courage, our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit. What is this saying? Just because you were born in it, it doesn't guarantee you're gonna live in it. You have been born in it, but now will you fully live? 
uh, years and years ago, I don't even remember how old I was. It was probably, I don't know, five, six, seven, I don't even know. It all blends together. We, we lived out at, on some acreage, my parents did, out by Pony Express Lake near Osborne, Missouri. Does anybody know where that's at? And we had about 20 acres out there. We lived in a single wide trailer, seven of us, single wide trailer. It was the same location that my dad lowered my brother Ben into a well to fix it. If you haven't heard that story, he survived. He's here this morning. It's all good. But I remember it, it was like one, one Christmas, and I don't remember whether it was Christmas Day or whether we're decorating for the Christmas tree or whatever it was, but it was one of those moments, families all gathering. For whatever reason, I got upset about something, and I was, if you knew me back then, you know, I was like, you know, just stubborn and, you know, all this stuff, and so uh, I'm not any at all now. <laughs> I love how you guys encourage me with your laughter. It's, it's great. But uh, I, got, I got upset about something, and I, like, stomped back to my room, and I refused to come out and participate, and I was just prideful and stubborn, and, and uh, I was not participating. I, I refused. My, my, my stubbornness and pride kept me from fully engaging in this wonderful, beautiful moment that was happening. And I missed out. I missed out. But I was talking with my, my parents a few weeks ago, or maybe it was a couple months ago, and I realized that there was somebody who missed out that it hurt more than me. Because I was talking with my mom, and she was, for whatever reason, brought up that moment. And she was like, I wanted so bad to go back there and just pick you up and make you come out and enjoy this moment, but I couldn't because of your stubbornness and your pride. And as a little kid, I never thought about that. I never, I never thought about that. But now as I'm looking at this, I have to wonder if, I, well, I, I, I believe this. I believe that God is more sad when we don't fully participate in all that he's placed in front of us. You know, and I, it really hit me so strong this week. And I was just like, wow, I never thought about that. I never thought about how God would be sad for us seeing all the stuff that we're missing out on, it really challenged me. It really made me think differently about that. But here's the good news. We can change it all. At any moment in your walk with God, Jesus is the ultimate reset button. That's what forgiveness is. That's what the cross is. And so as the worship team comes back up, let me share one, one last story. Um, I currently have in my life right now some people that are distant from me. They've chosen to be distant. And there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, there's nothing I can do. I've been cut off, shut off, and there's nothing I can do about it. I don't know a path back. I don't know how to, to what to even do. And I've tried to do everything I know to do, but it's still a broken situation. And there's every reason why I could just say, well, fine, if that's the way it's going to be. It's just like I could just put up walls and I could just say that, that that's that's fine that's just fine and I could I could have all these reasons why I would be I would have a certain approach to that but you know what I've done and I really mean this in my heart and you can talk to people that well my wife especially she knows this but I have decided I have predecided that when the day comes for any opportunity for restoration, that my heart towards them is arms open wide. I am not going to try to like, well, here's my side of the, here's the thing that you didn't think about, like here's all this stuff. And, and I understand there are times for that, but I've already predecided in my heart how that's gonna go. I've already imagined, I put my, my kingdom glasses on and I imagined what that would look like and I imagined it's open arms for me. It's not, it's not anything else. It's complete love. And so what I do is I pray for them daily, almost daily. And here's what I don't pray. I don't pray, of course, I don't pray, well, God, you know what's going on. So, you know, set it right and all this type of stuff or, you know, because I've been living life long enough to know that I have blind spots and I've got tons of them. And I don't even pray, well, God, let the truth come and blah, blah, blah. I don't even pray that. I pray, 
genuinely with my heart, pure, clean, honestly. Like if you could just, if you could just be in the space with me and, and Jesus as we, as we talk, I pray blessings. I put, my, a smile comes over my face when I pray for them. I pray, Lord, let your blessings overtake them. May they experience prosperity and goodness and joy. May today be a day where they experience the blessings of relationships. May they experience your goodness. May they experience your peace. I genuinely, from a clean heart, there are times I have to work at that, but I can tell you honestly, I've been practicing this a long, long enough to know that I can just pray for them with a pure heart. And that I've, just, I've pre-decided that there's nothing on my side that is a barrier to a future relationship. And I understand there's complex situations out there. I don't mean to make light of that. But here's why I say that. I do that because of what we're talking about. I do that because I realize I've been born into a faith. I don't make it up. Jesus says, Forgive others as I have forgiven you. Jesus says love. Jesus says you can walk in the peace of God. Jesus says to bless those who curse you. And so I have to decide, am I going to be born into a firm faith or am I just going to make it up because of how I feel? You guys are the type of people, I believe, at Journey Church that you tell me all the time, man, Pastor Sean, I love it when you pre preach it strong. Here's, here's what I would love is when you hear it strong and become a doer that's strong in the word. That we're not just hearers of the word and we don't just come around because we're fans of hearing strong words, but we're also fans of doing things that are hard because they are what God says to do. And that, here's the good news. We're not left on our own to do it. We are actually empowered by the spirit of God to do it. But I have to choose to participate in what I was born to do. And so that's, that's my invitation. I believe that's the invitation of Scripture. It's just because you've been born into it doesn't mean you're living into it. You're living fully. And so today, let's start fresh and anew. And let's give our heart fresh and anew to God. Let's give our situations fresh and new to God. Let's surrender our presuppositions, the things that we've come up with about how God works and the things that we've come up with about the Christian walk that have nothing to do with Scripture. But, and let's surrender those back to God. Let's, let's allow God to purge anything that we've adopted from culture that does not come from Christ. And let's allow those things to be purified, undefiled, so that our love matches God's love, not just for our neighbor, not just for those who love us back. Jesus said anybody can do that. But it's when you love your enemy, the stranger at your gate. It's when you, you follow along with God who loved the whole world and gave his life for it. See, that's our aim. That's our goal. That's my prayer. That's my heart. That's what I'm leaning into. Would you stand up with me as we go back into worship? And here's what I invite you to as we worship God during this moment. Yes, we're going to exalt him. We're going to draw near to him. But here's what I've also learned. Many times in a time like this, God is also speaking to us. And so as you're worshiping God, have an open ear to the Spirit of God. And I believe even as you're pouring out your worship to Him, He can be pouring truth into you. And so, Lord, that's our heart, is, is to be open to You. We've been born into a kingdom that's firm. It's not shaken. It's something we've received. We've been born into a family, the family of God, the household of God. Lord, we want to fully engage where You've put us. We have open arms to be able to embrace all that you have. And we look forward to the coming kingdom. We pull it into the now by faith and we begin to walk in that, live in that, have relationships in that, serve in that, give in that, look towards that, live in that. Lord, help us to be the type of people. As I had that word earlier in the year that this is a year where the plow is set deep for our church, but it is also a year of hope and fun. And Lord, I know I've already seen parts of it that are getting ready to come. This is a year for Journey Church that is going to be a plow set deep. But I believe by the end of this year, the things that you're going to reveal, we are going to be celebrating with a smile on our face. And so we look towards that in hopeful, faith-filled anticipation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.